Hello and welcome to another episode of the Healthy Hour Podcast. I'm DQ, and we have a very special episode in recognition of World's AIDS Day. Uh, this is a day dedicated to raising awareness about the AIDS pandemic uh, caused by the spread of the HIV infection and mourning those who we have lost to the disease. We're here to discuss, learn, and understand more about this significant global health issue. In the first part of our show, we're honored to have Dr. Nair, an infectious disease expert from Crystal Run Healthcare, who will shed light on the medical and scientific aspects of HIV AIDS. We'll dive into the importance of World AIDS Day, current challenges, and advancements in the treatments of HIV AIDS. Then in the second part, we'll be joined by Debbie Ramirez from Cornerstone. Debbie brings a unique perspective on the resources and support available for people living with HIV in Orange County. We'll discuss the practical and community aspects of living with HIV, including housing, food insecurity, and other supportive services. So stay tuned as we navigate through these insightful conversations to better understand and support those affected by HIV AIDS. Welcome to the Healthy Hour Podcast, Dr. Nair. Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and the role you play at Crystal Run Healthcare? Well, I'm a, an infectious disease doctor. I have been for the last uh, 14 years. I did my medical school training at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, and I did my resident, internal medicine residency and my, internal, um, and my infectious disease uh, fellowship at Robert Wood Johnson, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And I've been at Crystal Run for 14 years. What inspired you to specialize in infectious diseases? Infectious disease is one of those uh, specialties where it uh, transcends all of medicine. So every specialty always has a complication with infection. So if you have, uh, if you're a cardiologist, you can have a heart infection. If you're a pulmonologist, you have a lung infection. So um, in surgery, same thing. So it really allows me to interact with multiple different specialties and multiple different minds and, you know, really uh, pull everything uh, together. And it just always fascinated me, the, the field of infectious diseases. How has your work evolved over the years, especially in the field of HIV AIDS? Yes, um, I think treatment and management of HIV has really, really changed, um, particularly with uh, treatment and prevention. Um, treatment, for example, um, we've we went from multiple pills a day to now we can give an injection every uh, every two months, so six times a year uh, somebody can get a medication. And even with prevention, there's actually medication we can give for prevention, whereas when I first started, the only way to fully avoid HIV was abstinence, which of course is a very unrealistic um, method to STI and HIV prevention. Is there a personal story or experience that has particularly influenced your approach to infectious diseases and HIV AIDS? Certainly, um, just in terms of um, patient management. Um, unfortunately, I have still seen um, deaths from HIV, and it's usually either because they get diagnosed too late, um, they already have AIDS, or unfortunately, if they're not taking their medication. And those are probably the most heartbreaking because you do see people come into your office and they say they don't take their medications, and you try to encourage them as much as you can. Um, and um, sometimes it's, uh, it still doesn't, it's still not enough. However, on the flip side of that, you know, you have a patient who's newly diagnosed who comes in with AIDS and then they start taking their medications and you can see them get healthier and, you know, see their viral loads decline. And that is probably the most rewarding um, experience is just to see the change in people from being very, very ill to living their best healthy lives. For our listeners who might not be familiar, can you explain what HIV and AIDS are and how they differ from each other? Sure. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and basically it is passed through sexual contact or, you know, blood contact, you know, for example, IV uh, drug use. The term is HIV infected, and um, basically what happens is it affects a certain type of cell called the CD4 cell. And um, if... You've had HIV untreated long enough, you could develop AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And so that puts you in a category of um, being susceptible to various different infections that you otherwise wouldn't see if you were healthy, and as well as uh, cancers. The one good thing is that 
you can be diagnosed with AIDS, but then once you're on treatment, you no longer have AIDS and you're just merely HIV infected. And those are the individuals that can, you know, again, live long, healthy lives on treatment. How significant would you say is the impact of HIV AIDS globally and in our local communities? Well, in 2022, the WHO reported 39 million people in the world um, living with HIV and unfortunately 40 million deaths since the epidemic began, um, you know, over 40 years ago um, with 630,000 deaths in uh, 2022. In 2022 alone in the world, 1.3 million um, individuals are newly infected with HIV. So it is still still prevalent in in throughout the world, and it is something that we still need to be very aware of, even in our local communities. What are some of the common misconceptions about HIV AIDS that you encounter in your work? Misconception um, that I, I find is that anyone who can be affected by HIV, regardless of your sexual orientation, you know, in the beginning of the epidemic, it was considered, you know, the gay death, quote unquote, but anybody can be affected by HIV. If you are sexually active, you can be affected by HIV. You're always at risk. It doesn't matter um, what your sexual uh, preferences are. So that is a big misconception that I see. And also just in terms of transmission, as we were talking about um, before, you know, being undetectable means that you're untransmissible, which is a major shift in how we think about um, HIV. You know, I can give an example of pregnant women, for example. Um, When I was in training, we would tell pregnant women that they could only get pregnant if they had underwent artificial insemination. They couldn't get pregnant through intercourse. But now, if you're undetectable, you can, you know, get pregnant um, through intercourse and you can carry a healthy pregnancy and you won't transmit HIV to the, uh, the baby. So that again, has changed quite a bit in terms of the management of HIV. World AIDS Day is observed on December 1st. Can you tell us about the significance of this day and its impact? Uh, Sure. So it is a day of uh, solidarity for people around the world who are affected by HIV. Um, uh, It is a day to remember those lost and support those living with HIV. It also serves as a reminder um, to you know, the community at large, as well as to governments, that HIV has not gone away and we still need to pay attention to HIV because it's still an epidemic. Um, as I mentioned, millions of people around the world are living with it, dying, from, you know, hundreds of thousands have died from it. So it is important to have a day to remember those who have fought the fight in the beginning and to continue to fight now. What are the current challenges in the fight against HIV AIDS? I think the biggest thing is um, access to treatment, um, particularly with regards to cost. Um, unfortunately, I am still still finding individuals who are having a difficult time getting access to, you know, the recommended treatments. So we either end up having to give, you know, treatments that are very effective still, but they're not top of the line and I want nothing but the best for my patients and what is considered first line uh, therapy. So I think cost is a, is a big issue. Um, and then particularly with prevention, which I'm, you know, we can talk about that in a little bit, um, that also has become a problem um, in terms of people who are interested in taking pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, I do find that insurance companies are not covering um, PrEP, that's the short term for it. And um, I think that, is unfortunate as well because what's the term? A pound of cure. So, um, you know, I'd rather, you know, you take, spend the money up front, prevent the HIV rather than spend the money later in dealing with somebody who's HIV infected. So I think cost is a big problem. Can you share some of the latest advances in treatment and prevention for HIV AIDS? So certainly, you know, I've alluded to um, treatment. Um, Treatment has advanced significantly, Um, you know, in terms of medications. um, It really is one pill once a day. And now with the injectables, you can, you know, get HIV treatment. Um, You come into the office once every uh, two months for the injections. You do have to come into the office for the injections, despite what the commercials say on TV. But you don't have to take a pill every day after that. You come in, you get your injections, and then you're good to go and and you live your life. That is such a game changer in terms of management of HIV. And then on the um, prevention side of it, I mean, that in of itself has also been a great game changer. You know, before it was 
abstinence, abstinence, abstinence. And then if you are sexually active, condoms. But now we have PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. You take a medication every day to prevent HIV. And so that has definitely been a game changer in terms of just management of HIV and prevention of HIV. That really has you know, changed, probably evolved over the last you know, maybe five or so years. Like it has been really, you know, it was unheard of, you know, when I was in training to give an HIV medication when you don't have HIV, that just sounds insane. But now it's just, you know, it's, it's been amazing in terms of prevention. So that's probably the biggest advance I've seen. How important is public awareness and education in combating HIV AIDS? Oh, it's, it's certainly very important. I think it is really important to destigmatize HIV and really discussions about sexual health in general. It is really important, particularly for my colleagues to, you know, broach the subject of um, just sexual health in, in general. Um, and it's also important for, you know, the communities to be aware of what's going on locally in terms of sexual health, because in not just HIV, but other sexually transmitted infections are, you know, highly contagious that can infect the um, whole community. So it is really important to have, you know, a multi-system approach between the healthcare professionals and the community to have discussions about HIV and sexual health in general. Throughout your career, what has been the most rewarding aspect of working in this field? I think certainly um, dealing with the patients who have been HIV infected for so long and just the evolution of treatment. I was just having a conversation with a patient yesterday who was diagnosed in the 1990s and uh, he was telling me about how how his treatments have changed and just the side effects that he had. And then, you know, he he got approval for um, the injectable every other month. He's like, wait, I only have to come in every other month for treatment? This is amazing. So just the, you know, just the the joy of, you know, not having to take a pill every day was amazing. And then in general, just, you know, having patients come in and, you know, them getting excited about being undetectable, particularly if they're newly diagnosed, and then, you know, they see the effect of the treatments right away. Um, and I think that has been really, really rewarding um, as well, just to seeing how people have evolved over time in terms of their HIV management and living healthy lives. I have patients in their 70s, 80s living with HIV, and HIV is like the last problem on their list. Like they have other things. They have diabetes, they have hypertension, which is important to get checked out. Um, and then, you know, their HIV is kind of like uh, almost like a secondary diagnosis almost because they're just so well controlled with, with treatment. What advice would you give someone who wants to contribute to the fight against HIV AIDS, whether as a healthcare professional or as a member of the community? Definitely um, talk about it. You know, de like I said before, destigmatize it. Don't be afraid to discuss sexual um, preferences, um, sexual health as part of any primary care doctor's, you know, history taking. You know, are you sexually active? And then don't be afraid to have those discussions. You know, there are people who um, are higher risk than others. So it is important to be comfortable with having discussions around um, sexual health. And then, you know, that would involve evolve into HIV. So um, I think it's just really important just to be have an open and honest and non-judgmental conversation um, around uh, sexual health. As we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or messages you'd like to share with our listeners on World AIDS Day? Certainly, I think, um, I mean, we've come so far just in terms of um, treatment and prevention. Like I said, I would love to see just more equitable access to treatment and um, prevention. I think everybody should have, have the, everybody has the right to um, obviously be on treatment if they're infected and certainly have the right to take treatment, uh, take pre uh, medications to prevent them from getting HIV. So I would like to see just more equitable um, uh, opportunities for individuals um, for prevention and uh, for treatment. I'm hoping being that things will evolve in terms of treatment with the injectables and maybe doing it less than, you know, six times a year. If it's like every six months, that would be amazing. Um, you know, of course, people talk about the cure for HIV. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. Maybe at some point there will be. And, um, you know, they're also looking into vaccinations. Um, you know, so I'm hoping that maybe a vaccine will come out um, someday as another um, measure for prevention of HIV. Thank you so much, Dr. Nair, for joining us today and sharing your insights.
Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it was great to have this opportunity to share my insights on HIV um, prevention and uh, treatment. And again, you know, um, anybody can get it. So, you know, it doesn't matter what your sexual preferences are. Um, anybody in the community um, is at risk if you're sexually active. So, you know, if you are, you know, seek... Uh, um, you know, seek uh, attention or, or help, um, you know, in prevention. Um, you know, there are plenty of places that are anonymous, like the Department of Health, um, or, you know, I'm more than happy to see you as well <laughs> in my office. Um, you know, I, uh, we have some really good, honest conversations, but it's also very non-judgmental. So, you know, just, you know, go out there and, you know, no matter who you are, no matter who you are and what you do, you know, please go out there and, you know, get tested and, you know, get, and if you qualify for prevention, then definitely, definitely go out there and seek it. So once again, thank you, Dr. Nair, for that enlightening conversation and for sharing your invaluable insights on HIV AIDS. It's clear that understanding and combating this disease requires both medical expertise and community support. Uh, speaking about community support, I'm excited to welcome our next guest, Debbie Ramirez from Cornerstone. Debbie works closely with HIV-infected individuals in Orange County, providing not just medical support, but also helping address crucial aspects like housing, food insecurity, and other essential services. So with that, welcome to the Healthy Hour Podcast, Debbie. It's great to have you with us. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Again, thank you for having me here. My name is Debbie Ramirez. Uh, believe it or not, I have a degree in criminal justice administration. How I ended up here, that's the heart. Um, I first started working in the medical field in 2010, and I was working for a provider that had her own practice, and she kept encouraging me to work in Middletown Community Health Center, and she kept on. Every weekend she would tell me, apply, apply, I'll put in a word for you. So I finally did, and once I was there, when I was being interviewed, um, I was informed that there was a PC department. And I boldly asked, can I work there? And the answer was no, you know, they didn't have any, any openings. And um, I took the position for a representative. It's not what I wanted to do, it's not what I've been doing, but you know what? I am gonna get to that PC department one way or the other, so I took it. And uh, several months later, I was offered the position, and uh, I've been working, you know, case manager and uh, helping as much as I can, and being, on, you know, going on the journey with all the uh, clients. What motivated you to work in this field, particularly focusing on the support for HIV-infected individuals? Well, we all know in the 80s, this thing called AIDS came out, and people were people were dying. And then we didn't know what it was, and there was no cure. And so roughly in mid to late 80s, we had about, and don't quote me, we had about 70,000 people diagnosed with AIDS. Unfortunately, my uncle was one of them. I witnessed discrimination, isolation, humiliation, and segregation. I understood that there was a fear of HIV, and I understood that people wanted to be cautious. However, honestly, I did not excuse anyone for being so, so cold, you know, and especially not a doctor, not a nurse. They're there for us to provide bedside manners, to make us feel good, to assure us that everything's going to be okay. That's not what we got. That's not what we got from doctors. That's not what we got from nurses, from no one. Unfortunately, I lost four family members to AIDS, and... During that time, I mean, I was young. I was in my late teens, and I was like, what can I do? But I, I don't know. I don't have directions. I don't know anyone that's going to say, hey, Deb, here, look, work for them. No, everybody was scared of it, you know? So I just said, you know what? Um, it's going to happen. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. And throughout the years, I, I try to find a way. How? How can I penetrate that? How can I go in and help? And here I am. You're involved in a specific program at Cornerstone. Uh, could you tell us what the name of this program is and what are its primary goals? I am an intensive RAP specialist from Cornerstone Servicing Newburgh area. RAP is a New York State Institute funded program designed to assist patients who are newly diagnosed, have not achieved suppression, are beginning an antiviral medication for the first time, and patients who struggle with adherence regarding HIV regimen, HIV care, 
And also, it's concerning because a lot of this is affected due to probably personal events that are occurring in their life. Our staff will work with the patients to identify barriers that may affect adherence to medication and HIV care. We will work with our patients to address barriers and help our patients overcome and achieve suppression with the goal of becoming undetectable and self-sufficient. Our team acts as patients need, establish a plan specifically to our patients' needs, and provide one-on-one -on -one help from our staff case managers. We provide tools such as pill boxes, pill box keychain, planners. We are extremely proud of the work we do, and we will accompany our clients through their journey. We are in alignment with the New York State and the epidemic. Can you tell us more about the resources available in Orange County for people living with HIV, uh, particularly in terms of housing, food insecurity, and other supportive services? We have AIDS Drug Program Assistant, which is ADAP. They will cover medication. They will cover visits, dental, vision exams, and other services. We also have home community-based health services, pharmaceutical patient program, medical case management for adherence medical nutrition therapy, mental health services, oral health care, substance abuse, outpatient care, pathstone for housing, local food pantries, HVCS, which is aligned with us. So they offer case management, education program, nutrition program, preventative program, supportive groups to those clients that are enrolled in HVCS services. What do you find most challenging about working with the HIV infected population? The most challenging is the homelessness, the mental health issues, addiction. But again, you know, we have a program I and mean, they get the help they need. Regarding um, homelessness, it's pretty common. When our patients come, I give them a list of local food pantries. Then we also tell them when they're going to be there, like Catholic charities and churches. But it's just a matter of putting the word out there. Stigma is a problem, has been a problem, and hopefully in the near future it will stop being a problem. We're quick. We're very quick to judge. We're very quick to uh, have our own opinions. You know, we're very quick to, to dissect an individual and then just because of their HIV status, they're nobody. You know, and it, it pains me to have patients coming in. It pains me to have clients coming in. And they're afraid not only to disclose their HIV status, but also to disclose, hey, I'm gay or I'm, you know, whatever. But it's, it's painful. If our HIV clients already have barriers, they're carrying luggages, imagine you're living a double life, you know, and it's just so horrible to see that we discriminate and we stigmatize and it's just unfair. It's totally unfair, you know, and again, do unto others as you like done unto you. You know, and that's just, that's how I feel. I can have 50 clients come in and they can all have AIDS. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that, you know what, I address them, I acknowledge them, I hug them, and I tell them how important they are. You know, I will never, ever pass judgment on anyone. From your experience, what has been the most rewarding part of your work at Cornerstone? So the most rewarding part of my work at Cornerstone is having the ability to help, assist, educate, support, and encourage people with HIV. It's about informing individuals with HIV that it's not the end, but a new beginning. It's about being on a journey with your patients and emphasizing that an individual with HIV can live a long and healthy life if they are adhering towards HIV regimen and HIV care. I have always said and will continue to say all you need is love and understanding. I truly believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them done unto you. As a community, we must learn to help each other however we can. What advice would you give to our listeners who want to support HIV-infected individuals or get involved in related uh, community services? Each and every one of us can have a very impactful, important role in stopping HIV stigma and give a voice to the people with HIV, their friends and families. We can share our stories that can perhaps impact someone with HIV. We need to take the platform and urge everyone to work with one goal in mind, stop HIV stigma. When people living with HIV are discriminated, it's due to lack of understanding regarding HIV AIDS. Stigma is due to incorrect information. A person with HIV can be a lawyer, a doctor, a professional athlete, Olympic gold medalist, an elderly man or woman, a mother, a child, 
HIV does not discriminate, why should we? Before we conclude, uh, do you have any final thoughts or messages you would like to share with our listeners, especially in relation to supporting those living with HIV AIDS? I would just tell our listeners that they need to reach out to local HIV service organizations. They need to get involved with HIV uh, awareness events, uh, stay up to date with treatment, medication, and support groups, participate in advocacy activities. So first off, you know, I just want to thank you, Debbie, for coming on to the Healthy Hour podcast and just sharing some of your insights and knowledge um, on, you know, HIV AIDS, you know, while you've been working at Cornerstone. I think it's very important to just illustrate and showcase the different services and resources that are out there for people that are dealing with HIV AIDS. So with that, you know, is there anything else that you wanted to address or, you know, just state as a closing statement for your entry on this podcast episode today? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I really did enjoy this opportunity, the platform to speak. This is all personal for me. It has been, and I think the motivation for me to continue or to want to continue will always be my uncle. He was like a, you know, a father figure to me. And I mean, I love that man so much, but it's because of him I still strive. And it's because of him that I'm like, okay, I, we got to do more, Theo. You know, we have to do more. So my message to everyone is, again, we need to come together, you know, and uh, let's put aside all our differences. This is something that we can work on. And perhaps we're not going to find the cure right now, but guess what? We're going to have people not feeling as stigmatized as before. As we come to the end of today's episode, I want to thank our guests, Dr. Nair and Debbie Ramirez, for joining us and sharing their invaluable perspectives on HIV AIDS. From Dr. Nair, we gained a deeper understanding of the medical and scientific aspects of HIV AIDS, highlighting the importance of continuous research and medical advancements. And from Debbie, we learned about the critical resources and support available for those living with HIV in Orange County, underscoring the importance of community support and advocacy. World AIDS Day is not just a day of remembrance, it's a call to action. It's a reminder of the ongoing fight against HIV AIDS and the collective effort needed to support those affected. Whether you are a medical professional, a community advocate, or simply someone looking to learn and contribute, your role is vital. Let's continue to spread awareness, challenge stigma, and support each other in this journey. Remember, every conversation, every act of kindness, and every bit of knowledge shared brings us closer to the world where HIV AIDS is no longer a threat to the health and well-being of others. To our listeners, thank you for tuning into the Health Yard Podcast. Keep the conversation going, stay informed, and most importantly, take care of each other. Until next time, stay healthy and stay informed. Take care.